Hey, what's going on, you guys? Mike Imani here. In this video, we're going to just we're going to be doing uh, something different than the COVID videos I've been shooting out uh, lately. We're going to be looking at this intra-arctic balloon pump device. You probably have seen or heard of it if you're working on a critical care unit, especially more of a cardiac critical care unit. So we're going to be looking at this device, what it's used for, how it works, how to troubleshoot it, um, and all the all that. So the intra-arctic balloon pump device um, is simply consists of uh, the pump and uh, balloon. So the pump console, uh, which is this one right here, and the balloon, which is inserted into the femoral artery and goes all the way through your um, aorta. And the purpose of this device is uh, to increase our myocardial or our heart muscle oxygen uh, and to decrease the, dem the demand of oxygen uh, that our heart requires to perform its action. And it does this by inflating and deflating synchronously, that's a key word here, synchronously with the cardiac cycle. And that's what we call counter pulsation okay which means uh when our heart contracts and that is during systole systole uh the intraortic balloon pump uh deflates and when our heart relaxes and that's during diastole the intraortic balloon pump uh inflates okay um and by doing this uh it does two things one it does increase our myocardial oxygen supply okay so just like i just mentioned it increases the supply of oxygen to our heart and it decreases the amount of um, oxygen our heart requires to perform its actions uh, it's uh, indicated in case of acute coronary syndrome so if you have any uh, myocardial infraction that's heart attack in case of uh, high risk cardiac surgeries and a complicated heart failure uh, also keep in mind that uh, this device is a temporary use only and it's not meant to be used for long term some of the contraindication to uh, the balloon pump are advanced age uh, so if you're age of uh, 70, usually 80, 90 year old, expect not to get this device. Um, if uh, there is a chronic heart disease that you have, this device is probably not for you. Arctic dissection, um, if you have any kind of dissection in your our aorta, which is one of your big veins coming out of your heart, uh, that's a contraindication uh, for the balloon pump. Peripheral vascular disease, any form of um, disease on your uh, peripheral, usually on your legs, vasculature, uh, and this is because the balloon pump goes through your femoral artery and can easily block your uh, veins or arteries that goes uh, through your legs. So if you have peripheral vascular disease, definitely a contract indication uh, for using the balloon pump. Arctic regurgitation, again, abnormal beating uh, or opening and closing of the arctic valve. Um, also, if you have that, then intra-arctic balloon pump is a contraindication. So let's take a look at here the uh, myocardial consumption of our heart. And this is super important to understand before we go further um, into understanding the device, okay? Now our heart, how it uh, uses oxygen, it's all about supply and demand, okay? We gotta look at the supply and demand. If, and if we don't have uh, a good or a moderate amount of supply and demand, uh, our oxygen supply to the, our heart gets uh, compromised uh, and then that's where we start to have problems on our heart. So we are the, the purpose of this device is to have a moderate amount of supply and demand of oxygen uh, in our myocardial um, system, in our heart system, right? So let's take a look at uh, what uh, factors affects the supply of uh, oxygen to our heart and what, what factors affect the demand of oxygen, okay? So we'll put the demand on hold for a while and uh, let's talk about the supplies here first um, starting from the coronary artery anatomy okay so this is your great aorta descending aorta down here and then it branches off to your um, coronary arteries so your coronary artery anatomy that is 
typically your coronary artery does dilate when your heart requires more oxygen, right? So this is what you're looking at, a dilated uh, coronary artery. Uh, the problem is if you have, say, if you're a long-term smoker, your uh, diet is bad or anything like that, and you don't have a properly functioning coronary artery, then your heart muscle does not get properly perfused. So that's how coronary artery anatomy affects it. So if you have a well, if you have a good elastic, uh, properly working coronary artery, then your heart muscle gets well uh, supplied with oxygen uh, and on the contrary if you have a coronary artery that is not uh, very elastic or if you have any plaques like fat plaques um, around it then you're not going to get uh, properly perfused your heart's not going to get properly perfused so that's one factor that affects the supply of oxygen to our heart the next factor is diastolic time uh, but what i mean by that is Say, for example, taking care, looking at this picture, if you have a properly beating heart, a normal sinus rhythm, we talked about our heart rhythms in, uh, in my previous videos. Take a look at those if you have not watched it. With a properly beating heart, uh, you have a good diastolic time, which means um, when your heart relaxes, it gets a lot of time to gather enough blood that is later on pumped when the heart contracts, okay? So we have good diastolic time as the heart beats slowly. What happens during tachycardia or say when your heart beating fast, then you're not gonna have enough time in the relaxed state that is in the diastolic state uh, or phase to gather up enough uh, blood uh, in the ventricles to be pumped later on during uh, systole, right? During uh, when the heart contracts. So uh, the longer our diastolic time, the better the supply of oxygen to our heart. Um, also keep in mind is that during systole, our heart requires more oxygen than uh, diastole, okay? Systole is when the heart contracts, that is, uh, there is more vascular resistance and restricted and thus restricted blood flow to our coronary arteries uh, and on the other side during diastole when our heart relaxes there will be low vascular resistance and thus uh, less energy or less oxygen uh, needed uh, for the heart to work okay Oxygen extraction is another factor that affects the supply of oxygen. Obviously, if you have, say for example, the more hemoglobin that you have in your bloodstream, uh, the better oxygen you have. This is kind of straightforward. Um, and if your hemoglobin is low for some reason, say if you have bleeding, or again, if you're a smoker, or if you have any autonomic diseases um, and you don't have enough hemoglobin in your blood, uh, obviously that affects your uh, oxygen supply to your heart in a negative way. So these are the factors that mainly affect the supply of our heart. Uh, now that we've looked at those, let's take a look at the demand. Uh, factors that um, affect the demand or the oxygen demand uh, of our heart. And th that is the heart rate, um, afterload, preload, and contractility. So looking at the heart rate, uh, what do you think happens when we have a higher heart rate? Just like we talked about, our diastolic phase tends to be slower, so we don't have enough blood left inside the ventricles to be pumped when the heart contracts. Just because the heart is beating faster, uh, there's just not enough time to uh, accumulate a good enough, uh, a good amount of blood in the ventricles. So the higher the heart rate, um, the less. Um, the, uh, the higher the demand for oxygen. Also, the higher the heart rate is, uh, heart is having to work more and thus requiring more oxygen. So heart rate, the higher heart rate affects uh, oxygen consumption in a ne negative way. Okay, so we need a higher myocardial oxygen um, when we have a heart rate, higher heart rate. Um, how about afterload? What is afterload? Afterload, the first thing that should come into your mind when someone says afterload, when you, when you hear the word afterload, is resistance. And that is because afterload is the pressure that our heart needs to press against to push the blood to the rest of our body. So afterload is definitely a resistance. So uh, the higher the afterload, which means the higher the resistance, the heart have to work against, which means there is high amount of oxygen that is needed, okay? So high afterload always uh, goes hand to hand with higher oxygen demand. Uh, 
How about preload? Again, just like after load, the first thing that should come to your uh, mind when someone says preload is stretch, okay? That is how much our heart can stretch uh, to hold the maximum amount of, uh, or to carry the maximum amount of blood. And that is usually measured by pulmonary artery wedge pressure, or sometimes they just call it uh, uh, wedge pressure, uh, usually between 4 to 12 millimeter mercury. We're not going to dive deep too, too much into those. We're going to be looking at all this uh, hemodynamic numbers in, a, in another video. But here, uh, I want you to pay attention to um, what preload is and how it affects uh, the uh, myocardial oxygen demand. So the bigger the preload, which means the higher uh, or the more the heart has to carry more oxygen, the higher, more uh, blood, the higher the oxygen needed to later on pump all that blood back into the rest of the body. Okay, so the higher the preload, the higher the oxygen demand. Um, last but not least is contractility. So contractility, just like the name implies, it's simply how good our heart, how good our cardiac muscles contract. Obviously, if our heart muscle contracts good um, or the, the, the easier our heart muscle contract, the lesser the demand for oxygen. And if there's a problem with our contractility, uh, then our, our heart is going to demand more oxygen, okay? Contractility is usually measured in ejection fraction, usually after an echocardiogram, and the normal value is between 60 to 75%. Now, whenever the imbalance happens between the supply and oxygen, that's when the intraortic balloon pump comes into play in order to fix uh, this um, or to moderate uh, this um, uh, oxygen supply and demand. Okay, um, the intraortic uh, balloon pump is usually inserted through the femoral artery. Uh, it goes all the way um, to your heart through your um, iliac artery through your uh, descending aorta and it sits right around um, uh, right around your uh, descending aorta starting from the right below the subclavian artery the tip goes right below subclavian artery and the other tip uh, goes right at the renal arteries okay so this is uh, this is one reason that we constantly measure or monitor our urine output because uh, uh, there is a good chance if things go wrong, there is a good chance this uh, balloon pump might impede our uh, renal arteries, thus uh, destroying or harming our kidneys. So um, definitely we keep uh, monitoring our urine output uh, whenever our, our patients have this uh, device. It's a pretty long balloon, so all the way from subclavian artery the tip all the way down to your renal arteries um, through your descending aorta. So that's kind of the proper placement of the descending of the uh, uh, balloon pump, usually right after uh, insertion and uh, every day after the device has been inserted, uh, an, a daily x-ray is done and that's to confirm the right position of the balloon pump. Usually at the very tip of it, there is a, a little marker that goes right here, um, which is supposed to be between the second and the third intercostal space. So this is the very tip of the balloon pump. You, it's kind of hard to see it on this x-ray, but this would, the balloon pump is somewhere right here. And the tip of it uh, should sit between the second and third intercostal space. Now, if it moves, uh, there's a good chance that it harms uh, our patients. So that's why uh, we do daily chest x-rays to confirm uh, that it is properly positioned between the second and the third intercostal space. So super important to know that. Um, and the reason again is uh, to avoid incorrect position. So what happens if the uh, balloon pump gets advanced too high? Okay, so in the x-ray you'd see it say in the first uh, intercostal space, what happens is it tends to cut off our circulation to our hands and to our brains, right? If it gets, uh, if it sits too high, then it's supposed to be. So you will look at altered mental status, right? The patient th tends to get confused because their brain is not getting uh, perfused very well. And of course, the circulation usually towards the left arm uh, gets cut off. So you'll uh, definitely be lacking in pul pulses on that uh, left arm. So definitely keep checking your pulses when you have this device in your patients. 
uh, both uh, pedal and uh, bo uh, all peripheral pulses actually. Uh, and what happens when it's inserted too low or if it, get, if it gets pulled, say if you're repositioning your patient or for some reason if the balloon pump gets pulled down a little bit, uh, what happens is it cuts off our circulation to our legs, right? If it sits right here, for example, it cuts off our circulation to our legs. So you'll definitely notice a loss of pulse, uh, your pedal pulses, and definitely causes complication in our kidneys because remember the bottom tip of it sits right uh, at or right below uh, the uh, renal arteries. Uh, so definitely super important to be checking your pulses, uh, your mental status on your patients uh, quite often as possible. All right, let's, let's now take a look at how this bloom pump actually works. So just like I said earlier, the balloon pump um, inflates, right, when the heart relaxes or during diastole, and that's what we're going to be looking at here, and it deflates when the heart contracts, okay? Uh, so what happens during inflation or the, when the balloon pump expands is that during diastole is that it, it displaces blood back to the coronary artery, okay? This is what we call augmentation. Um, so it increases the perfusion to the coronary arteries, thus supplying the heart with more oxygen, okay? So during inflation, we get more perfusion to the heart with more oxygen. And what happens during deflation or when the balloon pop contracts, that happens along with systole, okay? When the heart contracts also, the balloon pump contracts. Um, it, decrease, it decreases the pressure in the aorta, okay? So that means our afterload, right? We talked about afterload being the pressure against uh, which the heart has to pump against. Uh, so it decreases our afterload, which means there is less requirement for oxygen. So it decreases the demand for oxygen, the deflation of the balloon. Um, looking at the waveform, you're, you're constantly going to be looking at the arterial waveform um, when you're working with the uh, aortic uh, balloon pump. And then uh, what you're going to be noticing is that it's going to have a trigger effect. Also, timing is uh, very important and we'll look at why that is um, in this video later on. But the tr our trigger event mostly is our R wave in our cardiac cycle. Okay, so each time the R wave um, happens or the, during the spike of the R wave is when the intraortic balloon pump uh, inflates, okay? Uh, the diacrotic notch here, super important, uh, and that's when the aortic valve closes and it signifies the beginning of diastole, okay? Right here is when the heart relaxes. So the pressure tends to drop down. So usually uh, when the patient comes straight from the uh, operating room, if it's a fresh open heart patient, let's say, or if the patient is unstable, uh, usually they tend to put them in one-to-one -one frequency. So the balloon pump can be set into a one-to-one -one frequency, and then later on when you win the patient from the balloon pump, it goes to one-to-two and down to one, one-to-three. So what I mean by one-to-one -one frequency, it, the, um, the balloon inflates and deflates with each cardiac cycle, okay? Every systolic and diastolic beat here is assisted, okay? So here you can see one cardiac cycle, um, and every, um, uh, systole right here. This is one systole here. Systole, systole, systole. All of them are being assisted because each time the heart uh, contracts, the balloon deflates, and each time the heart relaxes, the balloon inflates. So every systole here is assisted, and every diastole here is assisted also. So during one to one frequency, it's kind of hard to compare against what would happen if the balloon was not pumping. So that's why I want to include a one to two frequency um, in this video. So during one to two frequency, the balloon tends to inflate and deflates every other cardiac cycle. So here we're going to have assisted uh, systole and we're going to have unassisted systole, okay? So here are the, um, um, the ones that are marked here separately are uh, the augmented uh, diastole or during augmentation, okay? Um, uh, three of this um, uh, augmentation is, happens when the 
uh, balloon actually inflates. The balloon tends to inflate usually right at the diacrotic notch. So if you look at this particular bead here, right at the diacrotic notch, that's a perfect diacrotic notch. Okay, which means it is not assisted or the balloon did not inflate right here. But if you look at the next one, you look at the sharp V and that's, way, that's how you know the balloon actually inflated um, and then it, uh, we, we do have our augmentation here. So right after augmentation happens, the next one is going to be assisted systole. So right after augmentation, we have assisted systole and the diastole we see is assisted diastolic pressure. So here, here's our assisted in diastolic pressure and here is our assisted uh, systole. But the ones after it, the ones after are the ones that are not uh, that are not uh, augmented. Okay, um, those tend to be unassisted uh, diastole, right here is unassisted diastole, and this is unassisted systole. Okay, so that's how we kind of tell between uh, which beats are assisted and which ones are uh, not assisted. Uh, just look uh, what happens right after argumentation, and right after argumentation, we do see the assisted uh, uh, systole and the assisted uh, diastole, uh, followed by um, the unassisted uh, systole and diastole. So, um, uh, here's uh, what happens during uh, timing errors. Uh, the balloon may inflate early, the balloon might uh, inflate after, deflate before, or deflate after. So let's take a look at uh, each one of these timing errors individually, starting from early inflation. So what is happening during inf early inflation is the balloon is inflating right before or prematurely, uh, 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 right before uh, than uh, the diastole okay um, so the aortic valve is closing prematurely so what you see during uh, early inflation is um, the uh, sharp V that we see during uh, diastolic augmentation happens before or on top of the, our usual uh, aortic uh, uh, diastolic notch so our diastolic notch is supposed to be happening around somewhere around this line but um, our balloon inflated above that line actually so that's how you can tell it's an early inflation okay so what happens during uh, early inflation um, is that uh, we're not going to get uh, proper uh, um, oxygenation or proper uh, perfusion uh, through our coronary arteries to our heart, okay? So uh, it will be less therapeutic to our uh, patients. How about late, uh, late inflation? So what's happening during late inflation is the balloon is inflated, uh, being inflated uh, after, way after the heart has completely uh, relaxed. So in this case, it will be the opposite of um, early inflation. So here's our diacrotic notch line and the inflation is happening below, as you can see, below the diacrotic notch. We already have the diacrotic notch here, which means the aortic valve has closed, but the inflation happens right below that line. Okay, in that case, we have suboptimal augmentation right here, which is supposed to be here, but it's suboptimal because it's uh, inflated uh, late. So we're going to have suboptimal uh, augmentation and thus we're going to have suboptimal coronary perfusion. Okay, we're not going to have a good oxygen uh, supply to our heart. And what happens during early deflation, okay? During early deflation, the balloon is being deflated uh, right before or way before the heart contracts, right? So here we're going to see a sharp drop of assisted diastolic pressure. This is how you know, uh, this is how you can tell uh, early deflation right away. We're going to have a sharp drop in diastolic blood pressure and our unassisted diastolic pressure and assisted diastolic pressure are going to be pretty much on the same level, okay? So the heart is pretty much doing, uh, or the balloon pump is doing nothing to support the diastolic uh, blood pressure of the heart.
Um, late deflation, I think, is the worst of all. Uh, and what happens during late deflation is the uh, heart, uh, I'm sorry, the balloon pump um, is being deflated after the heart already has started contracting. Okay, so now the heart is having to fight against even a higher uh, pressure to pump, which increases our oxygen demand. Okay, it uh, it adds on top of the afterload that already uh, that already exists uh, so it's pretty much impending uh, the left ventricle the balloon pump is impending the left ventricle right uh, so here you'll see a wider uh, gap during uh, diastolic documentation uh, diastolic augmentation that's how you can uh, uh, pretty much tell uh, late deflation so this is the basics of understanding intraortic balloon pump or when you're taking care of someone with a balloon pump. These are kind of the general information you need to know uh, right off the bat. Uh, it's definitely not everything, but uh, it's just to give you a general idea of what it is, how it works, and how to interpret its reading. Uh, thanks for watching you guys. I will definitely be posting more videos like this. Uh, subscribe with the link below if you're interested and I will see you in the next video. Bye.